It's one of the challenges we have in the church today in 2017 is that when we say the word evangelism, everybody pauses. And I think if I went to each and every one of you today and after church on the way out told you that my goal this week was for you to go out and invite two people to church this week, there'd be a portion of us here that were nervous about that. I think there'd be a portion of us here that said, that's not my gig. <clears throat> I'm happy to be here and welcome people. I'm happy to cook. I'm happy to help clean. <clears throat> I'm happy to prepare <clears throat> the sanctuary, but I'm not the person that you want doing the inviting. I'm not the person you want to share the gospel. The elders and the deacons have been doing a Bible study this year called Unbinding the Gospel. As we started that book in the beginning, it talked about all the reasons that we today in this century are scared of evangelism. Some of the top ones are we don't want to lose our friends. We don't want to share the gospel and not have friends anymore because we've become Jesus freaks. We're scared we won't know what to say. What if we get a conversation with somebody and we don't know the right words or I don't know the Bible well enough to share the gospel. And some were just, we don't know why we should. Why do we have to share it? Well, today we're going to look at one of the first steps in doing that. As we prepare for Christmas, I think there is no better time than now to start sharing the gospel. Christmas is a time that everybody in the world seems to be a little bit happier. It's a time that even in Walmart, in the 10 items or less line, when there's 15 people with 75 items, everybody stands there patiently waiting. All right? So it's a time of the year we need to share the gospel. And the message today is about <clears throat> taking away some of those fears, easing some of the concerns. Because I will say this, they're valid. I know we all have them. I get it. It's not easy sometimes to do the things that we're going to talk about. We have challenges when it comes to sharing some of the things that are most important to us. But there's ways that Jesus set things up that make it easier for us to do that. And today we're going to start with a basic level of what that is. And we're going to call it the bunny system. And our scripture today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 6, starting in verse 6. And this is what is written. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, Leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. Let's pray. Dear Father, this morning as we study these words, as we spend some time in your instructions to the disciples on their first missionary journey, we pray, Lord, that you would give us a spirit of understanding here, that in this place, in this valley, in this community, you would help us to understand how to share your hope and your grace. That, Father, you would better equip us to be your disciples. We pray these things in your name, Lord. Amen. So, how about this first line? He was amazed at their lack of faith. You know, I read this the first time. My question was, how bad do you have to be for Jesus to be amazed that you're that bad? Right? We're talking about the Messiah. The Savior that went around casting out demons from people. Raising the dead. Healing the lame. Restoring sight to the blind. Making the deaf hear again. The mute speak. And his words in this very first part are, he was amazed at their lack of faith. It's a pretty condemning statement, I think, on the people he's talking about. I think for Jesus to have that kind of a conversation means that you're missing something really important somewhere along the line. This is the same Jesus that stood in front of Pontius Pilate and said, I am who you say I am. He didn't deny it. And he knew what Pontius Pilate was going to do to him. He knew the results of not defending himself that day. And it doesn't say anywhere in the end of Matthew 27 that he was amazed at the lack of faith in Pontius Pilate. But here it does. So who's Jesus talking to, right? We didn't read the first few verses. Who's he talking to? Well, Jesus is talking to his hometown. He's talking to the people he knew best. The neighbors he grew up around, playing in the streets. The people in the town that he helped his dad build tables and benches and chairs for. <laughs> The people in the town that he had talked to their kids while they were on their way to school. The people in town that he saw at the supermarket and said, how you doing today? 
These are the people. The people that Jesus grew up in the town as the Messiah sent from God. They wouldn't listen to him. They wouldn't hear anything he had to say. And we start here, I kept this verse today because I want it to be clear as we go through this. We're going to come back to this a little bit. But evangelism has 90% to do with God's spirit. And 10% to do with our willingness. And those numbers are probably skewed. But just to give you an idea where we're at. So Jesus leaves that town. And I don't think that town realized what happened until much later on in Jesus' ministry and things start to come together for them. That he grew up here. He's maybe the guy we should have been listening to. There was maybe a point in Jesus' message that we should have heard and reckoned with. There's maybe a point in time that we should have asked for our hearts to be prepared for the Messiah. You see, for evangelism to work, and the very base of what we're going to look at today is that the Spirit of God has to open hearts. We look back in the Old Testament, we look at Pharaoh as the, as the exodus happened and the people, the nation of Israel left. We have all these plagues, right? Locusts, blood in the river, famine, no rain, up until the killing of the firstborn. And every time Moses goes back to the Pharaoh and says, Pharaoh, let God's people go. Let's go. All this will be over. Listen to God. And every time there's a phrase in the Bible that says this, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And he told Moses to get out of his chambers. You see, we have to allow the Spirit to work ahead of evangelism for the message of God, for the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to be brought into the mix. Jesus knew in his hometown that the hearts of the people that he grew up with weren't ready for the message. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. As I read this week, I thought about my community, my neighborhood, where I live. Where are we at? Where are my neighbors? Have I taken the time to go out and invite my neighbors to church, to faith, to teach them about Jesus Christ? I may have a little bit of an advantage. A lot of my neighbors are related to me. <laughs> but there's some of those that I never have. And I'll be the first today to stand up here as we begin this journey in learning and understanding evangelism and say, I'm not perfect at this either. There are opportunities in my neighborhood that I have not taken the opportunity that I've been given to share the gospel with. That was on my heart this week as I was writing this message. Is, you know what? I have work to do in my hometown too. So we need to start somewhere. We need to have an understanding of where evangelism happens and how it works. And I think it starts with an understanding of their hearts being ready. So we're going to start there. Before we get to the rest of the scripture, before we get to the bunny system, before we get to what the disciples took or didn't take, before we get to the towns they went to and the places they did, we have to start with one very important thing in evangelism, and that is this. We must pray for where we're going to go. Now part of this study of unbinding the gospel that has been going on is that your deacons and your elders have been praying for this community of Eastbrook since about March. That the, the community around us, hearts would be open. That we would be ready to share the gospel. And foundationally, if you're going to do evangelism, you have to pray first. So missionaries go out into the world to new places to serve God. They spend a season in prayer before they ever go. Asking God to give them guidance, to give them wisdom, to give them discernment. But also asking God to prepare that place for their arrival. Not for them, but for the message of good news in Jesus Christ is coming. So the first thing I'm going to encourage us to do as a church is to pray for the place, the mission field, that we're going to do evangelism in. It's the community around us. It's the best place to start, right? You know, I can tell us all that to do evangelism today, we had to get on a plane and head to China, or to Russia, or to Antarctica. And all of you are going to say, oh, that's not me. I don't even have a passport. I don't fly. I don't do long drives. I don't get on buses. I don't do trains. Right? I've heard it all. And I understand those reasonings. And I'm not saying you're wrong. I get it. But the mission field starts with your next door neighbor. It starts with a house down the street. It starts with a school. It starts with a fair. It starts with the suburbs of Newcastle. We don't have to go far. We're here. We're in our mission field. 
So the first thing we need to do to prepare the mission field for Jesus Christ is to pray for it, to pray for those around us, for our neighbors, for our friends, for those that we haven't met yet. Right? We need to pray for those. And I'm sure that all of our neighborhoods have the neighbor that nobody wants to stop at. Right? That's part of growing up. But we need to pray for those neighbors probably even more. That they would be prepared and that we would have the spirit to go and speak and share the news. So if we get that and we understand that and we're ready to pray, get on our knees and pray for our neighbors, <clears throat> for our communities, for our schools, for our friends. What's the next step? Well, the next step is actually sharing the good news, right? The next step is walking up to people and saying, do you know about Jesus? Do you know what he did? Do you know that Jesus was sent here by God the Father? And he was born a baby and he spent 30 years preparing for his ministry. And he grew up as a carpenter and he did all kinds of cool things in his neighborhood. But at 30 years old, his mother took him to a party, a wedding, and Jesus began his ministry. And explaining to them how Jesus ministered through healing and teaching, through prayer, and then telling them the best news. Jesus Christ died on a cross for you. But it doesn't end there. I mean, if it ended there, what would the story be? It'd be like every other story that we've ever read, right? It'd be like every movie that the hero dies at the end. You leave the theater going, oh, that was an awful movie. But if you leave a movie and the hero dies and somehow comes back in the last scene, right? If you all watched Star Wars, you were waiting for Luke, right? You were waiting for that green lightsaber. Good hope. When we see Jesus come back, when we tell people the good news of the gospel and say Jesus died, but you know what, folks, it didn't end there. Three days later, he got up. And that is the focus of the good news of the gospel. He did that for you. It's hard to share that message with people we don't know, and it's even harder to share that people, that message with people we do know. So Jesus gave us a system. And I think Jesus, in his infinite wisdom, gave us a system that is foolproof. Because I know it's hard when you have to go do, do things by yourself sometimes. Right? I remember as a little kid, my parents would send me to the basement to get stuff, and I don't know why, but I hated our basement in the house. Right? I don't know how many of you had this, but it was dark, and it was dungy, and for some reason my parents didn't think you needed to put very many lights in a basement. If there were one or two, you were good to go, and if the ball blew up, don't worry about it. It'll be okay. Right? We all had those basements growing up, I think. But when somebody would go with me, I never thought twice about it. My first hunting excursion tomorrow as we start deer, we got about halfway into the woods and my dad goes, I forgot my glasses. Go ahead without me. Right? And I'm 12 and I'm thinking, I don't even know where I am. Go ahead without you. Right? It was scary. But when there was somebody with me by my side, all of that fear seems to go away. Jesus tells the disciples to go out two by two. Now I think Jesus at this point in time could have looked at Peter and said, you Peter, go over there. John, you go over there. Matthew, you go that way. Tell me what you find out. But Jesus knew in the end they would all come back and he would say, what would you do? And they're like, well, we didn't really talk to anybody. We didn't have to start the conversation. We didn't know them, so we didn't want to cause any problems. So Jesus sends them out in pairs. And Jesus says, go two by two to the towns and the villages around where you are. Share the message of the gospel. And then come back. See, friends, when we share the message of the gospel together, it takes away some of those fears, some of that trepidation, some of that, that uneasiness of nerves that we have when we're by ourselves. If nothing else, your wingman can back you up while you're running away, right? And so, as I always tell my friends when we're out in dangerous places, I just have to be faster than the guy beside me, right? And get out of there, right? We want to take friends with us to encourage us. It's important for several reasons. Number one, it's a support system. Jesus sent the disciples out to support one another, to help each other, to encourage one another as they share the gospel. He sent them out so that one could be praying while one was speaking. So if Peter got up and started to give a message, Matthew could be there praying, God, be with him in his words. Calm his spirit, calm his nerves, give him what he needs to share the message that needs to be heard. He's there to make sure that you have somebody watching your back. Because there are times that it's dangerous be honest. There are places that we share the gospel that may not come back. It's the way the world is right now. It's the way the world was then. It's the way the world's going to be until Jesus comes back. There's a buddy there to pull you up when you're down. When I was in Boy Scouts, any of you that were in Scouts know about the buddy system. When I was 12 years old, we went to Scout Camp for the first time. and We went to swim in the pool the first day and the lifeguards stopped everybody. 
It says, find your buddy. I'm thinking, I don't have a buddy. I don't know who my buddy is. Well, they paired us up, and we got buddy tags. And if you went into the pool, there had to be two buddy tags hanging side by side. If there weren't, they yanked you out and made you stand outside the fence. That buddy was there to keep you safe. That buddy was there in case you got in the water you couldn't get out of to get help to bring to get you out or to drag him out yourself. That buddy was there to make sure that if you needed something, he got it for you. He was there to make sure if you didn't hear the lifeguard, he got you the message loud and clear. That buddy was a protection system. We don't always like that. I know at 12 years old, when I had to find a buddy to go swim in the pool, I was like, Ugh. Especially when my buddy didn't want to go swim. I'm like, come on. It's time. The pool's open. It's hot. He's like, well, I'm whittling today. I'm like, no, no, no. I don't want to go swim. Right? I'll tell you this. I was that buddy who didn't like to swim. Still don't to this day. But it was important we had that. And it kept us safe as young men learning how to do outdoor sports. I tell the kids today when we go hunting, they always go with somebody. So somebody knows where you are. You're safe. You know what's going on. Right? When I travel, my wife knows where I am. She gets an itinerary, so she knows what's going on. And we have certain times that we check in. Evangelism is real life. Friends. It's the same thing. So I don't know where we learn somewhere along the line that we're supposed to do this all on our own. That we have to be pioneers for the faith. And one at a time go out there and just bring the gospel on our own. If you can, that's awesome. And I don't want to slow you down and hinder you from doing that. But you don't have to. And I think most of us hold back and don't because we don't think about taking somebody with us. So the buddy system. And the second part of the buddy system is really going on faith alone. Jesus <clears throat> talks to the disciples. And <clears throat> if I were there, I'm not sure how I would respond to this. This is what Jesus tells them. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except the staff. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm going on vacation, I look at my wife and say, pack nothing. We're going. She's going to look at me and say, you're nuts. And she's going to pack before we leave. Right? If any of you, if I tell the group is going to Alaska, don't take anything. Just the clothes on your back. We're going. I'm willing to bet that group of 56 gets a lot smaller when we go to get on the plane. Right? We as people want to be prepared for everything that we think might happen. Jesus wants us to rely on faith alone. And when he told the disciples to take nothing, he knew the result was going to be they had to rely on the Spirit of God and on God's direction to get where they had to go. When we do evangelism, I think we rely on everything else. We rely on the preacher or the elders. We rely on the church as a whole. We rely on the Billy Grahams of the world to share the gospel. We rely on the, the morning radio or on Caleb. Like, oh, these people are sharing the gospel. We're okay. But they're not speaking to the person you have the opportunity to speak to. They're not having the one-on-one -on -one conversation over coffee at a job site. They're not the ones that are sitting down at the dinner table with the neighbor saying, Hey, have you ever thought about Jesus? Do you know him in your life? They're not the ones breaking bread together with people that don't know. And having an opportunity to have a one-on-one, heart-to-heart -on -heart moment. To share faith in a way that they're not hearing it anywhere else. Friends, our faith is so personal. Jesus Christ is a personal Savior for each and every single one of us. It's impossible to share that personal relationship through mass media. Jesus set up the early church of disciples going out two by two, and that church grew to millions in a couple of years. Because it was a personal relationship and a personal engagement with people that hadn't heard about Jesus. Somewhere along the way, we've forgotten about that personal part. Everything's Facebook and greeting cards. It's Instagram. It's all that stuff that I really, truly don't understand, but my kids are spectacular at it. Right? The world is changing. But as I tell people in the sales feed, they tell me, you know what, you don't need a personal relationship. Or people buy by websites. And I said, you couldn't be farther from the truth. If I have a customer that knows me well, and we know each other's kids and our wives and our families, I may not get the order, but I guarantee you I'll be the last one who gets to look at the price before they buy it. I may not be the one that gets the first order, but I'm going to get the second and third because I'm there and they know me. Sharing Jesus is the same way. We have to do it on a personal level because he's a personal savior. Our story is our testimony. Our story should be a reflection of the good news of the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So where do we go? How do we start? Well, I think first of all, we need to be willing to go out. We need to be willing to jump in and go. And your buddy may be sitting beside you today. 
If you're a Grove City College grad, at the time I was there, there was a lady named Nancy Paxson. She was the Dean of Women's Affairs. And Nancy stood up on the stage for the freshman greeting every year. This was her thing. She'd say, look to your left and look to your right. And the students would all do what we're supposed to do because we're freshmen and we don't know any better. And Nancy would say, you just looked at your future husband or wife. Welcome to Grove City College. Right? So I'm going to tell you today, look to your left and right. And I will tell you this. There is a huge percentage of Grove City grads that get married at the end of college. I know there's two sitting right here. Right? Let me tell you to look to your left and look to your right. Your buddies are here. The people around you are the people that can support you in this ministry as we go out. Including myself. We do this together as a team. We do this together because God called us to do it together. Jesus did it with a group. Jesus could have went about his whole three years of ministry by himself, but he didn't. He brought 12 people with him to help share the gospel, to teach, to make an impact. So I want to encourage you today as you go out, think about who your buddy is. And you may have several. You know, at the bowling club, you might have one buddy, and when you go golfing, it might be another. When you go out and you go to dinner with friends, maybe you bring in another set of friends with you that are also Christians, and you share the gospel over coffee. Think about it. We're going to talk about evangelism for the next several months in different ways. <clears throat> we're going to look at some of the missionary journeys that Jesus sent the disciples on, and we're going to look at some of the ones that are the best recorded, which were Paul's. Because he went about Southeast Asia, as he eventually went to Rome. How he taught the gospel to people who didn't know. How he shared the message of hope. But even Paul took a buck, right? They all had somebody with them. So friends, today I want to encourage you as we begin the season of Advent next week, we kick off Christmas, to start to think about this season, these four weeks. We'll put a goal in front of us that's manageable. How do we go out and share the gospel in the Christmas season? Maybe it's in a line at Walmart where you're standing there with all those other people with the ten items or last line. And the guy beside you complains, say, hey, what are you doing this Christmas? You know why we're here? You know what my church is doing? You know, the Savior that we serve. And you know what? When you have captive audiences, you have to listen. So take advantage of it. Not to be pushy or mean. But quite the opposite. If we truly believe that Jesus Christ is the only path to heaven, if Jesus Christ is the one that redeems our souls and saves us from our sins, if without Him we are lost and alone in darkness, and with Him we are brought to light and salvation, why wouldn't we share that message? Because we know that if people haven't heard Jesus, it's not a good future for them. So friends, today, share the message of hope. It's Christmas. The best part of it, Christmas, is giving gifts. And I encourage you this season, this Advent, this Thanksgiving, to be thankful for God and all He's given. And as a response to that thanks, tell people about Jesus. That more would come to know Him, and God would have His children coming home. Let us pray. Dear Father, we pray today that you'll be with us and guide us that you will lift us up in your spirit. That, Father, as we gather here today, that you would give us a spirit of willingness to go out and to share the gospel. That, Father, as we go to our neighborhoods, that you would open the doors. That, Father, we go speak to the neighbors in our neighborhoods, as we go speak to family members and friends, we go to work, and we pull out a Bible for devotions, as we're standing in Walmart or Giant Eagle or Aldi's getting our groceries the Lord, you would prepare the hearts of those around us. And when we show a cross, when we talk about our salvation, when we share the great, awesome, stupendous news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the people are ready to hear. Father, we thank you for this time today, for the gift of grace, for the hope in Jesus Christ, for salvation and eternal life. It's to you we lift all these things and we're thankful. In your name we pray. Amen.